But man, I mean, I I've, I actually uh, sat down. It's been such a long time since I've watched Alien 3. Yeah. Um, and I sat down and watched it for the first time in a very, very long time this afternoon. I actually watched the, um, not the theatrical cut, the, the, the director's cut that's on ah. the, the awfully named Alien Quadrilogy box. Oh, that drives me around the fucking... I, drives me I, up the I'm wall. fully aware of what a pedantic, you know, uh, bore that makes mm-hmm. me, but it really does. Yeah, it's me not, too. That's me not too. a fucking word. It's not a word, no. There and is it's a, a shame. perfectly nice word for that. It's called a tetralogy. A tetralogy or something, or whatever, you know. It's a great... What annoys me is that set is probably one of my favourite DVD sets ever made of anything yeah it's lovely it's it's just so much fun i remember uh, getting it when i was at university and you know being the it's kind of work shy anxious kind of guy i was i had lots of spare time when i was at university so i remember getting it and watching everything on it in one yeah. huge ridiculous session um the commentaries the uh, the making of featurettes and i mean for every film that's on that yeah. set um yeah. and just falling in love with it absolutely falling in love with it i mean i've always loved the alien films anyway i, I just I, I adore those films on a kind of sentimental level um because they've they've kind of always been there you know they're they they are artifacts of childhood for me as much as things like the transformers or children's cartoons or whatever um so i've always enjoyed them but sort of returning to them in that format and learning how they worked and where they came from and how that those wonderful designs came to be realized is just the most amazing thing that that's fascinating you have a very different relationship with the series than than i do yeah, um than most people speak- i think <laughs> Yeah, I mean, thinking of them as like objects of childhood nostalgia on on the on a par with Transformers. Mm. That's that's a very unexpected way of looking at them. It that's really is. Not... I, I'm fully aware of how weird it is. I, I, it took me a while <laughs> to realize how very strange that is, but I I understand now. <laughs> It's wonderful, though. I love it because there, there is so, there is something wonderfully indiscriminate about childhood, isn't there? And the and the childish approach to you, you, you really. I think I, it's it's that you just don't have those filters installed in uh-huh. your head that that we do as adults. So you just approach everything completely on its own terms, That's and you it. don't go in with preconceptions. You know, you don't go into anything thinking, right, this is a serious film mm-hmm. and this is just a bit of fun and stuff like that. You approach everything the same way, whether it's you know, um, an episode of the real Ghostbusters or or John Borman's Excalibur. You know Exactly. You just, I mean, unless you yeah. are told, unless those parameters are conditioned into you, then you don't have them. It's as simple as that. Um, and I wasn't. I, I never was. Neither I or my brother. We were always allowed to watch whatever the hell we liked. <laughs> um, <laughs> under the proviso, of course, that if anything actually scared us, then we wouldn't be watching it again. But it never did, you know. There was never anything that came up um, that actually distressed or disturbed us. And I think that's largely because of the way my parents marketed them to us, which is that they are films, that they are created things, and they made sure that we understood that before we consumed them you know um and that i mean it it really all it's the only lasting effect is that it's made the pair of us absolute boorish horror snobs (laughs) yeah no i i i don't want to um sound like i'm casting shade on your childhood but i i can't help thinking you know from my perspective that's it's almost an unfortunate way to go about it because i didn't I didn't get that. I mm-hmm. I wasn't I wasn't um, told when I was a kid. You know, it's it's fine. This is a this is an artifact of of art and uh-huh. performance and stuff like that. I so I went into things without that reassurance. You know, and right. I think that's. I, I was I was really a bit of a wuss when I was a kid about <laughs> about scary stuff. I have to say. Um, I, I so I didn't get exposed to a lot of things maybe as early as you did you mm-hmm. know I I came to them later in life because frankly as 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 a young kid I was just too much of a coward right. to tackle stuff <laughs> you know like the Nightmare on Elm Street movies and stuff like that um, and um, so I think coming to it a little bit later I've 
I I don't know. I mean, everybody everybody's uh, childhood has has its own disadvantages and advantages, uh, you know. But I feel like I feel kind of lucky sometimes that I was able to experience some of these things when I was a little bit older, so that I didn't get that acclimatizing effect. That that, that is a problem. That is definitely a problem. I mean, I uh, I do find myself now. I mean, and I consider myself an enormous fan of horror as a genre. Obviously, I mean, I, yeah. I even create stuff within it, but um, I do find that it's very, very difficult finding stuff that actually moves me in any particular which way. Um, I really crave the stuff in in every medium that actually is going to disturb and distress me, and it's very hard to find. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very much the same, but with kind of boundaries. Like there's certain things that I just I I don't watch, and I uh, I haven't watched, and I never will watch because uh-huh. I know they're just they're just too much for me, and I right. you know I can't take it. Like I know you know I'm never going to go near any of like the hostel movies ah. or um you know the seasoning house or mm-hmm. the um the a Serbian film or right. I'm just I'm just not I'm just not having it. You know, it's just not yeah. for me. I just so you know I'm not drawn to that edge experience perhaps Mm -hmm. as much as you are although i do go for it within my parameters Mm -hmm. i mean for me it's uh with regards to films like the hostile films for example now i powerfully dislike those films and pretty much everything within that subgenre what what was labeled the gornography genre um simply because uh, it's not because of any offense with regards to the subject matter i just find it to be a one-trick pony uh, once you when you sit down to watch films like the Hostel films, and you realise all it's going to do is show you extremes of bodily mutilation, that's all it's got. There's absolutely nothing underneath. There's no. There, it doesn't use that to say anything or to express something, which a lot of great films do. I mean, if you look at, for example, the the early Hellraiser films, you know, there is a lot of that in in those films too. But they have other things functioning underneath. So there's almost like an artistry to these scenes of bodily mutilation. In films like Hostel, there isn't. It's just trying to shock you. And when you realise that's what the film is trying to do, you, I, I kind of have this uh, i shrug my shoulders and go well that's all you've got isn't it well yeah no, it, it's interesting because i have friends i have at least two friends whose opinions i i take very seriously i respect mm-hmm. their opinions who who tell me that there is more to the well to at least some of these films you know like mm-hmm. i have one friend who's who's um very very sophisticated knowledgeable cineast mm-hmm. who goes to bat for a film called wolf creek oh which is i know a wolf creek. semi Yes. Yeah, you know it. I don't. Um, it's Creek. a it's a semi fictional movie about some uh, murders which took place in in the Australian outback. It's phenomenally horrible. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've never watched it, and I never will because mm-hmm. I'm too much of a coward. <laughs> but I know what happens in it. Yeah. Um. You know, and to be honest, just reading the description of the plot is enough mm. to just upset me to the point. Where I'm and on also, edge, I, th- I think know? the fact that is, I mean, obviously, it's it's uh, it's a fictionalization, but the fact that it is based on things that actually did happen. Yeah. Um, is makes it even more terrifying. I mean, Wolf Creek, I, I would separate from the likes of Hostel um, because no, Wolf Creek, although it does have those elements, it, it does throw some really repulsive visuals at the viewer it also has other things going on like there is there is sincere atmosphere for one thing there is this incredible sense of dread and desperation in that film which i i just don't get from host from the likes of hostel or or most of what are called the the gornography films i i just don't get from them they they are all about the set pieces those films they they are that's all they are they are vehicles for these elaborate set pieces where they're trying to show you oh, this extreme or that extreme and trying to evoke a reaction that isn't in me. I, I, I'm not going to react to it, I find, other than to sigh, to be honest. Yeah, no, I mean, this is where the you know my, the disadvantages of my approach tell because I you know as I say I, I haven't watched these films and I'm I'm mm-hmm. not going to. So no, there is. I mean, I just... if if you find horror, certain artifacts of horror to be too much, don't watch Wolf Creek. Mm. it's it's well, a nasty I, yeah. piece of work i mean like yeah. it's it's got this this spiritual dirt to it that feels filthy to watch and to experience yeah. and and yet you know i could i mean hellraiser 2 is mm. one of my favorite movies of all time that, that, that that's fascinating because that, that that's is a film, 
that's got about, it too. <laughs> yeah, about which you could say the same thing. Yeah. Um, what I, what I, what I was going to say was that you know I I have another friend whose opinion I also uh, respect very highly, who will go to bat for the hostel movies mm-hmm. or at least one of them anyway. Who, right. who 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 tells me? And as I say, I I can't dispute it because I've never seen it. So I don't yeah, plan right. to. You know that, that that there is more to it. That there's something going on in there that's interesting, and that's mm-hmm. fine. And I respect that uh, opinion and 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 all that stuff that you that you have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. It, there is there is just something about for me it's not really like the gore like gore mm. itself i can handle yeah you know i've 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 watched some pretty gory films in my time and and been okay with it mm-hmm. for me the the thing that i find hard to take is the sort of prolonged depictions of terror and, yeah. and suffering yeah i f- i find that very very hard going i find um, that if a film is going to do it, and if it's going to do it in a particularly realistic manner, like outside of like a fantasy, a fantastical or supernatural mythology, it needs to earn it. There needs to be some reason for it. Um, I, I watched. A, a, I love found footage horrors. I really. I, they're one of. It's one of my favorite. Well, you know, it's interesting horror. because I love. I love the original Blair Witch Project, oh, and that is all sustained it. terror. Isn't yeah. It? Love so, it. Sorry, go on. No, it it is one of my favorite horror films of all time. That one. It always scares me. I don't know what it is about it. I I probably could try to describe why, um, it has this this profound emotional effect. But I, it would it would probably be a simplification of the truth. But every uh, every single time I watch that film, I get that wonderful sense of cold inevitability. That mm. dread, because you know, I, I I love the fact that there is a point in the film where, as the audience, you just know they're done. Those they're doomed. They're, yeah, yeah they're, they're not getting out of this situation, whatever the hell it is that's actually happening. Which is wonderful because it maintains the mystery all the way through. Is it the the Blair Witch quote unquote? Is it something else? Who knows? Who knows? Whatever the hell it is that's happening to them, but what whatever it is, it's cruel. That's one thing. It is almost mindlessly cruel and is enjoying yeah. their terror. Um, and eventually it's going to fall. That sword of Damocles is going to fall and they're going to be done. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, I found that I find that powerfully uh, affecting. And, yeah. you know, I in, in other things, too. This is this is the interesting thing, because, you know, I, I was saying it's like depictions of torture. I can't handle. Mm-hmm. I can because another of my favorite films is the battle of algiers right um that has scenes of torture in it Mm -hmm. um and i mean just thinking about films which have that inexorable feeling of dread there's a movie a very fine movie from the 70s called it's not a horror movie it's Mm. a well i I would say in some ways it is a horror (laughs) movie but it it, it's sort of officially in genre terms it's a um it's a thriller. It's a conspiracy thriller. Right. It's called The Parallax View. I don't know if you know that one. I have heard the title. I, I don't think I've ever seen it, though. Yeah, it's well worth seeking out because it also has a moment similar to the moment you just described. I mean, other, different people would put it in different places. You know, mm-hmm. it's not a it's not a, a specific like scene or, or one line or something where mm-hmm. everybody agrees, oh, that's the moment. It's not like that. Yeah. But I would say everybody at some point watching this film would feel the plot sort of tips over and you think, oh, this guy is completely fucked. Uh, this guy's doomed. He's cornered. It's over. He's, uh-huh. he, this, we're just watching the process of him being cornered and, and being killed now. you know. And that is absolutely fascinating. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing for a yeah. piece of work to do, whether it's marketed as horror or not, you know? Um, yeah. It's it, There's this kind of Hitchcockian thing going on, you know, where the film reaches out to you as the audience and says, okay, you're in on the conspiracy now. The characters aren't. The characters are still going to scrabble around like ants in a jar, trying, thinking that they can get out of this mm. situation, and they never can. You know that, we know that, but they don't, and we're going to sit and watch them. It's a kind of, it appeals to a, a really hideous part of <laughs> the uh, the viewing audience, and like good yeah. films, good films, whether they're horror or not, acknowledge that, and they utilize it. They almost make the uh, the audience start to realize that that is the case. That they're, oh, sure. you know, yeah. they they're they're voyeurs. They're actually voyeurs to voyeurs. suffering. 
Yeah, in and a, that's, I mean, that's oh. arguably why Hitchcock is such a great director, because Hitchcock is absolutely a voyeur. Yeah, know, totally. That, that is his psychology. Um, and loads of his films are about that. I mean, obviously, Rear Window, you know, wow. it's, it's just texturally, texturally about voyeurism. Right, I mean, like, but, thematically, it's almost like a self-autopsy of his voyeurism, isn't it? <laughs> in, in a yeah, way. absolutely, yeah. But well, I mean, one of one of my favourite moments in any Hitchcock film, and it's a it's a deeply troubling, problematic film, um, is is Marnie. Mm. Um, there is a sequence where the the character Marnie, played by Tippi Hedren, is a uh, what used to be called a kleptomaniac. Right. Uh, and there's all sort there's all sorts of bullshit sort of Freudian psychology in yeah. the movie. As there often is in Hitchcock. I was going to say, about... as Hitchcock often does. Yeah. 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 But um, there's a scene where she, she, what she does is she sort of moves from place to place and, and gets jobs as secretaries under, mm-hmm. under different names because, uh, you know, it's Tippy Hedron. So she just walks in and says, I'm your new secretary. And just these, these 50s <laughs> businessmen just go, right. Yes. Okay. Fine. <laughs> and, and then she, then she like the, the, the Janet Lee character in Psycho again, <laughs> She she rips them off and moves on. Mm-hmm. And there's there's one scene where she's I can't remember exactly what she's doing. She's going through a safe or she's going through the the drawers of a desk or something <laughs> like that. Very 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 much not what she's supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right after hours on her own in in the in the office, and you sort of half the screen it, the the camera is in a corridor so to speak, uh-huh. and half the screen is us looking through the doorway into the office where she's doing that, and the other half is the cleaning lady working her way up the office corridor. Right. And Marnie is completely unaware of the advancing oh, cleaning lady. Oh, it's brilliant. It's just, yeah, it's incredible. And it's silent. Yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? Like, yeah. so th- that escalating tension, which is actually measured in footsteps, like visible footsteps. Yeah. Very, very clever stuff. I mean, I've, I've got... Um, I, I do have a massive soft spot for films that have that element of voyeurism in them i mean it often disturbs me it often really distresses me i mean a a more recent example i can think of is the witch um yeah i almost raised that in connection with blair witch project because it's one one of the things about blair witch project is that it's so freighted with history it has this historicity about it doesn't it? it it has this deep sense of a connection to american history uh you know in the forest which is sort of the essence of american gothic you know as the x-files endlessly exploited the forest <laughs> the, yeah. the edge of civilization the, the primal settlement of the of the puritans etc mm-hmm. etc that's sort of the that's ground zero for american gothic and uh yeah the, the witch very much ties into the same sort of historically freighted american sense of horror yeah it just goes for it doesn't it i mean it actually drags that kind of cultural subtext and neurosis out into the limelight what i love about the witch though the sense it gave to me when i was watching it for the first time is as though i was looking through a window at this this family on something terribly terribly private which is this disgraced families slowly going mad together for various reasons and seeing things that i probably wasn't supposed to be looking at that made yeah. me feel wrong made me feel almost dirty for having seen it and i i kind of love that i think that's a brilliant thing for certainly for a horror film to evoke yeah, and that's one of the amazing things that's done by... I mean, just just in terms of The Witch, one of the things I love about The Witch is the way it deconstructs gender roles in patriarchy because mm-hmm. you have this father figure who is forced into the position of being the head of the family despite the fact that by nature and temperament and character he is absolutely not fitted for it. Absolutely. He is not a leader. And you have his wife who is absolutely a dominant personality, an alpha personality, Mm -hmm. who is forced into the position by patriarchal gender roles, patriarchal structures. She's forced into the role of the subordinate, the second in Mm -hmm. command, the person who is kind of hostage to the husband's decisions, despite the fact that she's clearly the dominant personality. And you have this sense, I mean, she's awful. The the way she behaves is is dreadful. Mm -hmm. But you, you get this incredible sense that this is this is something that's been done to this woman through you know this this has been her entire life of just stunted frustrated constantly you know knowing better and having her own ideas and knowing what needs to be done and never being listened to and never being allowed to uh, take the reins even by men who don't even particularly mm-hmm. want to be holding them yeah it's absolutely true i mean it's something that it it, it pervades that entire film every character in it is a victim from the first frame 
from the very yeah. first frame. And we, of course, we learn as the film goes on that they are actually uh, victims of the wider culture in the sense that they are excommunicate for whatever reason. They're excommunicate from their uh, culture, from their society, and that is more or less a death sentence. Yeah, they're the, they're the separatists from the separatists, aren't mm. they? They're the, the people that fled from the people that fled. They're, right. they're right out there at the very edge. They're like that original American condition taken absolutely to extremists. Trying um, to scrape a you... living from the, the most hostile conditions imaginable. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, I was about to mention The Shining, Kubrick's The Shining, oh, in, well. in, in connection with the idea of voyeurism. I mean, that, that film is profoundly about looking. It's almost the um, text for it in cinema, isn't it? It's certainly it, it in is, horror cinema. It? Yeah, yeah. But it's also a film where you're looking in uh, through a window, as it were, upon a upon a profoundly private family crisis, a uh-huh. sort of uh, the 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 the, apo- the nuclear apocalypse of the nuclear family. You yeah. Know? And you get that sense all the way through of almost embarrassment that you're watching it. You know, I shouldn't be watching this. I'm yeah. eavesdropping on something that I shouldn't be seeing. Um, and that's also about like the the primal uh, American experience out there in extremists on the frontier trying to scrape a living mm-hmm. out in extreme conditions. Out in it, extreme it, it, conditions. It's almost yeah. like, but it's like the same story, but in a postmodern setting, isn't it? And I love the fact yeah. that the hotel. I mean, what I love about Kubrick's version of The Shining, it's certainly not the same in the original book, because in the no, original no. book, you know, King makes it overt. No, the hotel is haunted. They are ghosts, and that's what's happening. Um, <laughs> In Kubrick's The Shining, that's not necessarily the case. This this very well could be whatever ghosts there are. They're psychological ghosts, aren't they? You know, the family bring them there with them, um, and all the hotel does it. It acts as this wonderful kind of psychic amplifier, and manifests all of the problems that are already broiling away all of those tensions those unspoken tensions in the family unit. It's a haunted family, not a haunted house. Well, it, it's it's a haunted culture, you know. Yeah. That, I mean, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be talking about Alien Three, but yeah, we, yeah, we we'll get there. The, there'll we'll there'll be the some. Shining, I'm going to be here all night. Right, there'll the be some is, segue is... somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the Shining is just a film I'm absolutely obsessed with. You know, I could talk about this at, at just forever. Oh, but I love it. It's... I love The Shining to bits. I mean, I, I've always found yeah. King's attitude towards it questionable. Um, generally, I, I kind of get on with King in a, in a lot of ways, but he's always been rather snifty about Kubrick's The Shining, and I've never under I've never really gotten a clear picture of <laughs> well, what I, his criticisms are. I think it's because it's such a personal book for him. Mm. You know, I I mean, I I love old Steve, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> S- Stephen King's book The Shining is a rollicking, good fun ghost story yep. with some with some fantastic touches. Kubrick's movie is a is a masterpiece. Like. Yeah. You know, there's no such thing as the greatest film ever made. But if you put a gun to my head and said, "What's the greatest film ever made?" You... I'd probably say <laughs> Kubrick's The Shining. Um, but for but for but for King, it's it's an intensely personal story. It's about him grappling with his alcoholism and the fact that at points in in that era of his life, he he was afraid that he might be a danger to his own family. You mm-hmm. know, and 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 stuff like that. And I I understand. Well, of course, I you know I don't really because I've never been in that position. But I can imagine how it feels to have something so incredibly personal taken away from you yeah. and made into somebody else's incredibly different and incredibly distinctive work of art. That that kind of I mean, it does talk about stuff like uh, alcoholism and you know domestic problems inside families and stuff like that. But it's very much not from the inside of the of the tormented father's point of view, which is kind of where the book comes from. <laughs> definitely um, true. The, I mean, also, the film... I mean, the, the, fil- the, the book definitely has a redemptive element at the end, whereas oh, yeah. the film, not so much. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've, I've talked about this with Kit and, you know, I, I always say like <laughs> the shine that like Jack in the shining is kind of what Jack in the book looks like to everybody else yeah. whereas jack in the book is what guys like that think they look like from mm-hmm. the inside you know yeah but the, the, um, there's almost like a tormented hero quality about him isn't there you know in in the book he's uh, he's a, he's a tormented guy who ultimately is decent you know uh whereas in the film no no he's 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 pretty much a bad guy who's trying very hard not to be <laughs> 
I don't even know that he's trying not to be, to be honest. Yeah, yeah fair. <laughs> yeah. He's just a bastard. I mean, one of, um, um, one of King's criticisms that I, I can kind of see, I can kind of understand, is that because he's played by Jack Nicholson, you just know from the very beginning, there's, there's no question that this guy is going to go nuts and hurt people. From, so there's, th- th- I suppose you could say there is no overt arc as such. Um, but even so, that doesn't really bother me when I watch The Shining. It just doesn't bother me at all. Well, yeah, I mean, Kubrick's just not interested in characterization in that way. No. You know, Ku- Kubrick is just not interested in doing that. Uh, here's a character study uh, of this guy and this woman and, and so on and so forth. And here are the things that happen to them. And here's how they grow and evolve and change mm-hmm. and interact. You know, that sort of classic storytelling, you know, that the, the bad internet critics now mistake for just what stories are and if mm-hmm. things don't conform to that they're badly written you know that sort yeah. of thing he's just he's just not interested in that he, he really isn't he ha- he has bigger fish to fry that's that it i think it. that's it he takes like the intimacy of the the original book and just does away with it and turns it into a, a thematic exercise you know he's exploring something much more resonant much bigger arguably almost cosmic in its scale you know um and i think maybe that's what king is reacting to because i mean one of the thing king does does do with his stories they are always intensely personal they're always intensely human there's a, even the bad ones have a lot of heart in them there's a lot of sincerity in them whereas kubrick yeah. i mean one of the criticisms that often is leveled at kubrick uh, with regards to his entire back catalog is that there is a a coldness there's like an intellectual anodyne quality to his films which I, I, is kind of true uh, I I I've never been able to see it. Like if you look at something like Paths of Glory, mm-hmm. I mean, wh- how could anybody look at that and call that cold? Or mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, he's he he is he is detached in a way that somebody like Spielberg isn't, for instance. Right, right, he, yes. He he is he is in no way uninterested in actors bringing out characterization, sometimes of intense power. I mean, wow, just look at The Shining. I mean, I, mean, right. I think. I think Shelley Duvall in The Shining, it's one of the greatest cinema performances. And it, it's it's just incredible what she does with that role. Yes, and, and uh, what kind of Kubrick coerced her into doing. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, did a, I did a podcast about this with uh, my um, my friend Christine Kelly, who, the, <laughs> who's also a blogger and a podcaster. And we talked about The Shining and the title of the episode. Uh, it was it was on my show, The Shabcast. The title of the episode being um Shelley Duval directed the shining mm. because what we decided was that kind of from the inside um Shelley Duval kind of made that film what it was mm-hmm. almost against the odds despite the fact that while she was making it she was being psychologically <laughs> you know viciously psychologically abused by Stanley Kubrick just Cuba. absolutely tormented by all oh, of Oh yeah I mean there's no yeah I mean I admire Kubrick enormously he he was an absolute abusive vicious bastard uh-huh. to Shelley Duvall on that film there's no there's no two ways about it <laughs> no. and and his greatness doesn't justify it either that's the other thing people mm-hmm. will you'll get that sort of special pleading. Well, you know, he, yes, he did that, but he was a genius and he was trying to coax a great performance out of it. Right. Fuck off. That Fuck doesn't off. Absolutely. Anything. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, no film is worth someone's psychological stability. No, no. film. No. But even so, you are right. Her, her performance is incredible because it seems so sincere. And it's it's it feels legitimately like how someone would react in that situation. She is not... Like a lot of... Um, I suppose I, I hesitate to say it, but like the the victim characters in horror films, there is this tendency for them to be much more competent and composed than anyone yeah. would be in the situations in which they occur. Whereas she isn't, and yet she does incredibly well. I mean, this is mm. one of the interesting things. You you often hear this, um, like. Uh, people will say King's version of Wendy is so much more competent and so much braver and stuff like that. I mean, I I reread the book fairly recently the last time i reread it i don't know it was a couple of years ago Mm -hmm. and i was surprised to give king his credit i was surprised firstly by how rough he is on jack torrance because he is some of it is really really condemnatory you Mm -hmm. know more so than i remembered and he he displayed on upon the reread i found that he displayed more understanding of 
what those sorts of guys are really like than uh-huh. I'd remembered he did. So, you know, credit to King there. And the other thing I found was that Wendy in the book really is just a cipher. She really yeah. is just like um, this this thing male writers who like the idea of themselves as feminists do sometimes. Uh-huh. You know, Stephen Moffat. Um, <sighs> they, they will yes. write women who are ostensibly incredibly brave and competent and admirable and stuff like that. And yet there, there's nothing there. There's just kind of yeah. what's really there is just a man's idea of an admirable woman. That's and it. Wendy in the book is saved by Dick Halloran. Right. Right. Now, one of the things the film gets a lot of stick for, and you, this is not unjustified, um, is killing Dick Halloran, mm-hmm. um, who is a black man. He's the only black man in it. Right. Um, and, that's not that i mean that in itself is not great it kills him mm-hmm. um so you have yet another film where the, the black character turns out to be disposable i yes. get that that's true there's no dodging that criticism but at the same time the thing it allows you to do is it allows wendy to save herself and danny yeah ad- admittedly using the snowcat that that halloran brought up to the hotel but wendy in the film is incredibly brave and admirable because Mm -hmm. i mean the film is honest about the fact that she's not a tremendously brilliant person it's honest about the fact that she's not overwhelmingly intelligent right Um, yeah and kind of i mean i hesitate to use the term but weak there is there is a kind of weakness to her at the beginning of the film isn't there well i think what the film is doing is it's showing you that you know this is the kind of woman that that kind of man seeks out and marries (laughs) yeah because the, 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 the Jack Torrance character in the film is absolutely a narcissistic, emotional and psychological abuser. Mm-hmm. And guys like that, they seek out women that they think are weak to to dominate them, yeah. to have control over them. And absolutely that is true. That is what's happening. You, you The film manages to convey, in all sorts of ways, that relationship. Like, for instance, in, in the first scene we see her, Wendy is sat at home with Danny, and she's reading... And she's reading The Catcher in the Rye. Ah. Now, this is, a, this is an adult woman mm-hmm. who's reading The Catcher. And now she could be rereading it because it's her favorite or something like right. that. But it could be that this is the first time she's reading it. And this is like, you know, page one of American literature, yep. right? This is what they give you when you, when you start learning English at mm-hmm. American high school. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a woman who's catching up. This is the impression you get. This is a woman who's trying to catch up. She's trying to educate herself. Why is she doing that? She's got this husband who thinks he's a writer or wants to be a writer or plans mm-hmm. to be a writer. And you just get this implication seeping out of the screen that, yeah, this guy, uh, you know, he plays up what an intellectual he is and what an artist he is. And he belittles her. Yeah. He, he enjoys being married to this woman that he can look down on because she's never read Catcher in the Rye. Right. You know? So he's um, he's a man whose ego is terribly wounded, you know, by the fact that he's not successful as a writer and probably yeah. never would be never would be no like jack in the book has already published a book of poems or short stories or something Mm. there's no indication that jack in the film has ever or could ever publish anything right right he is just working on his book isn't he that's it he's he's, just working he's one of those guys i mean i'm i'd probably be careful because i'm one of these guys myself (laughs) he's one of these guys that's always working on his book (laughs) right right but it never actually transpires yes like um like kasorbon in uh, middlemarch you know (laughs) it's just it's his excuse for doing nothing yeah yeah and also for being a terrible person to the people around him it becomes like i'm you know i'm working on my book why is this child making noise why are you interrupting me and so on and so forth when in fact what he's expressing is his general frustration with himself and his life that he's built and uh the fact that he dislikes himself yeah and he takes that out on on his on his wife and kid and the the woman that he's married is is a woman that he doesn't fundamentally like he views her with contempt like Mm. again the performances are brilliant jack nicholson and shelly duval put this across particularly in the scenes where they walk around the hotel at the start when they're getting the tour you get the sense that this guy just he he has almost open contempt for his wife yeah you know yeah and he he just looks down at her and he married her so he could do that that's what guys like that do they yeah. marry women they can they hold in contempt so that they can walk around looking down at them and oh yeah it's so it, much cleverer than that. it's the yeah. narcissist's attitude to relationships isn't it it's it's yeah. not that this is someone that i want to spend my life with or that i i adore or that i have some sort of connection to it's someone i can use for my yeah. own emotional instabilities and baggage and whatnot but what yeah. i love about the film more than anything is that it establishes all of this in such a subtle way 
Yeah, it never. Brilliant. There is never once a moment where you know the characters all sit down. Like uh, you know, a lesser filmmaker maybe would have set it in like a marriage guidance flashback or something, <laughs> where char- you know a therapist says, "Hmm, yes, well, this is what's happening in your relationship," and blah 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 blah. It doesn't need to do that. It does it with subtext. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the things I hate in movies, just to, to go on a on a byway, yeah. is um, when people have arguments and they eloquently express their real grievances of <laughs> yeah, each other. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a real knockdown, drag out argument with somebody that you're very emotionally close to. I certainly have. Mm-hmm. And that's not how it works. No, it's that's incoherent. Just not what you do. You're like a ch- it reduces you, doesn't it? It doesn't yeah. elevate you. Anger doesn't e- in those situations doesn't elevate you. It doesn't make you more eloquent. It does you don't you don't come out with these incredibly insightful pithy one-liners or insights or anything like that. It's frustrated, it's foot stomping, it's it's that thing where you just can't articulate yourself and that makes you angrier and even more frustrated. Well, um, that's the reality about you don't argue about the things that are the actual subject of the argument. Right. You argue about other things. Yeah, that's it. You know, that's it. Most of the time, because you don't actually know the real reason you're arguing. You're arguing. That's but, that's the thing, isn't it? But in bad writing, in all forms, that's what happens, isn't it? You get characters who understand. They understand what to say. Yeah. In any given situation, and I find that I. I, I mean, it, don't get me wrong. There are certain forms of fiction where you can get away with that because that's just the. It's the heightened nature of that yeah. universe, you know. Um, noir, for example, you you can oh, get yeah. away with that in noir fiction because that's the way people speak. Um, shows like Hannibal, you can get away with that because it's a, it's an elevated universe where everyone does speak in this incredibly poetic and composed way, and that's just the way it is. It's so stylized, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I'm I'm a I'm a fan of Shakespeare and early modern drama. You know, mm. I'm fine with <laughs> unnaturally eloquent. <laughs> of course, of course, high yeah. speed. I'm it. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, very often in monologue or soliloquy form, where there's no one else there to talk to. Yeah, but context is everything, isn't it? And yeah. um, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's so, there's so much of that kind of bad writing, and it's reached its apotheosis. And well, I think maybe the worst of it has passed. I think the the height of it was probably to hark back to a previous show we did. The, the height of it was probably those Nolan Batman movies, <laughs> yeah. where people just constantly stood around elucidating the themes <laughs> of the movie at each other. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I mean, in fictional terms, it's stuff like Fifty Shades of Grey, where all it is is just navel-gazing about motivation, but with no insight oh. at all. Like, yeah, no I've... insight whatsoever. I haven't I haven't read those, but I have watched um, Dan Olson's uh, videos, YouTube videos about them. He did oh. a series of three videos about the three movies where he compares them quite closely to the to the books and also analyzes them as movies, and they are they are fascinating. And those books sound hypnotically bad i mean yeah. i'm, kind of, the, the, I'm kind of wary of going in too hard as a lot of people <laughs> did against stuff that was kind of a um what's the word uh you know a a a, 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 a sneak up uh success among women mm-hmm. you know because there's a hell of a lot of sneering at stuff that women like and especially yes. women yeah. the stuff that women find sexy and especially the stuff that older women find sexy yep so i don't want to i don't want to go in for that necessarily as a lot of people did in the same way that look, there's a cottage industry now about sneering at twilight you know because yeah. we yeah. our culture has this contempt for teenage girls mm-hmm. but at the same time from those videos of dan olson's those books do sound just galactically terrible (laughs) they are and yet they're a lot of fun they're fun because they are galactically terrible i mean it's uh, those videos of dan olsen's are a lot of fun i've watched them several times well i mean i one of my most treasured experiences is being at a um a convention a few years back and a friend of mine was reading 50 shades of gray in the voices of 1980s cartoon villains (laughs) <laughs> so it was Skeletor and Mumra and so on and so forth. It was hilarious. Um, but no, I mean, I'm, I'm always very careful about the language I use when I criticize those books because it is not because they are erotica, for example. It is not because no. they are erotica aimed at women. There's good erotica out there. There's very good erotica out there. These are bad. <laughs> These are just bad erotica. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I would never, ever, ever dare to presume to say to anyone if that's what they enjoy. If it's if they get, you know, their titillation out of it, fine. 
go for it. You know, I've yeah. got no problem whatsoever. Do as thou wilt. Um, but I do, I do find myself tearing my hair out when I realize that there's very, very good authors of erotic fiction out there who just cannot get a contract, who cannot get off the ground, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very telling, you know, that, um, there's such widespread contempt for the the trash that women like, whereas the the trash that men like, right. like the Jack Reacher books, etc., right. has such a status. It know, actually that. gets elevated, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, the uh, the ultimate expression in many respects, I suppose, is kind of like some of the the Marvel films, some of the MCU films. They 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 are absolutely male gaze trash for the most oh, yeah. part. But what happens? They're actually marketed as though they are the the very definition of what cinema is in this era. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I think uh, Bond is 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 a good example as well. Wow. I mean, I I really like the first two Daniel Craig Bonds. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I know everybody hates Quantum of Solace in the universe, but except me, <laughs> I, but I re- I really really like that film. In fact, it might even be my favorite Bond movie. Right. But oh. the, the weird thing about Quantum of Solace is that I like it because it's probably the one that's least like a Bond film, right. which is why all the Bond fans hate it. But <laughs> the, the thing that it does is it tries. I mean, it's still a Bond film, so it's still happening in fucking Narnia, you know. But it tries to engage with the real world to a certain to a certain extent. It tries to. I mean, it does this. It does this thing where it kind of makes you think the baddies are trying to control oil, uh-huh. and it turns out what they're trying to do is they're trying to control water in like this water starved uh desert state you know right. and that's actually that's actually quite and and the villain is kind of this guy who he's a he's a tech billionaire who poses as an environmentalist uh-huh. there's some there's some really good stuff in there there is you know? actually commentary but, going on you know which is yeah. not not often something you get in a bond film is it really no but the point is, I mean, that somebody has tried to elevate Bond, which is pure just male wank fantasy. Uh, totally. You know? And it, it, often of the most pernicious kind as well. Oh, it's awful. It? It's, I mean, it's vile. It's <laughs> like like rape fantasy, isn't it? It's Absolutely. like, you know, it's, I, I, I was going to say that it's sort of one step shy, when actually, when you look at some of the older Bond films, it's actually not one step shy. It actually just is. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, in Goldfinger, Bond just straight up rapes pussy galore. I right. mean, that's just that is it's just mm-hmm. textural you know it's not even implied um and funny we were, we were talking about marnie before um one of the reasons that film is incredibly uh, difficult to watch now and difficult to make sense of is that it features a um a corrective rape oh, and it's it's right. sean connery again yeah sean well. connery is is the love interest in that film and there's actually a scene where he he sort of coerces tippy hedron's character marnie into marrying him and then on their honeymoon she because she hates she hates sex. She hates men right. and, and sex. And it's, you know, the, the film is about, you know, how that dreadful thing happened to her. And it traces it back to her childhood trauma. Because, of course, a woman must be psychologically damaged if she's not into sex with guys, you know. Oh, don't it's, we it's, know it's, it? It's just awful. Don't we know it? I mean, there's an entire like subgenre of fi- of cinema at the moment that actually is built around that very notion. It's, it's this hideous phenomena of taking... Di- female Disney villains and turning them into live action cinema, oh, yeah. which explores their backgrounds. And I, I tell you, I watched, I watched Maleficent, <laughs> and I was primed to love that because yeah. I, I, I love villains. I wrote a thing uh-huh. a few years ago about how the villains in stories often have an objectively better moral position than the heroes, mm-hmm. and they're just the villains because they're shot in a certain way and they look ugly and they're in the dark, and we're just we're basically just informed that they're the villains. Yep. And what they are is the people who are outside of the polity, outside of the society. Yep. They're outside of the power structure, or they challenge it in some way. The villains are the people that want to change the world. Mm-hmm. I think works the other way this. as well. Yeah. It works the other way in a lot of popular fiction, like in fantasy fiction for example there are so many characters where the the author the writer the narrator will tell you these are the good guys these are the characters who are trying to do everything right they are supreme paragons of virtue and often you know very often they're supernatural paragons of virtue they're almost like virtue elementals they're angels or whatever your gandalfs your aslans and so on yeah and yet the way they act is objectively awful oh yeah yeah um <laughs> And it's so, I mean, it's so constant that it's, it's, it's almost like a sociological proof, you know, of the (laughs) idea that culture derives from established power relationships, because it's just such a constant, 
in Western culture that the villains are the people who want to change the established social system in some way. Mm-hmm. And it might be, you know, like in, in the Harry Potter things, Voldemort, you know, he's 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 basically a magic Nazi. Right? Yep. <laughs> so if, if, if we if we look at it from that point of view where, you know, he's like, oh, people with the right blood are better and they should be in charge. And we can say, OK, well, that's that's not good. We don't like that. Mm-hmm. But he's still the only person in the story who actually wants to change the world. And yes. when you look at the wizarding world as it's drawn by 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 Rowling, Mm-hmm. and inhabited by all the quote-unquote good characters, it's a fucking awful play. It's a mm-hmm. dystopia. It's a fascist totalitarian nightmare. And the good guys, Dumbledore and Harry Potter, they're the ones who spend the entire thing struggling and fighting to keep it exactly the same. Oh, it's and absolutely that is true. Just, that is just the pattern. Yeah. Over and over and over again. It's absolutely one of my principal objections to Harry Potter. This this was you know long, long before... All anything about jk rowling's particular beliefs and proclivities came out um i just i just dis always powerfully dislike the harry potter mythos for that exact reason it's the fact that it you have a situation where there is this entire secret universe happening alongside our own where there are people who can even the children a single child from hogwarts could realize a utopian vision for the entirety of humanity that is beyond the dreams of any utopian philosopher that has ever been in the muggle world as it were and yet what do they do with it what do they do with this with this magic these miracles it becomes like a a commercialist a materialist wank fantasy it's it's awful it's awful it's 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 making it's taking miracles it's taking something amazing and potentially transcendental and turning it into a commodity a children's toy as, oh, I hate it. I hate it so much. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, there's so much to say. It's another subject where you know I could just I could go on for hours about this one. But um, I think the reason I I brought it up was I was I was talking about um, you know Maleficent and I mm-hmm. and I was saying that I went in primed. Yeah. Um, because I I went in with the pre-existing mindset, you know, a, a predilection for villains. I've always. I've always been attracted to villains. My favorite fictional characters are so often the villains. My, you know, Likewise. my favorite fictional character of all time, the one I'm fascinated with above all others, probably is Shakespeare's Richard the Third. Right. right. So, and and so many of other of his villains as well. I mean, I- I- Iago. Iago et cetera, is et like the 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 pri- You know, he is like villainy made manifest, isn't he? There's, yeah. there's like there's yeah. almost nothing else to him. He's just sumptuously, satanically evil. Yeah, and yet, as uh, Fintan O'Toole wrote about him, the play is 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 almost his tragedy as yep. well as well as Othello's, to the extent that they're even separate people. Because one of the fascinating things about the play is that they start to merge and change sides and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But again, if you get me onto this, I'll be on this. <laughs> but the, I, I went into Maleficent primed because I I have a predilection for villains. I have a fascination with villains. I have this pre-existing. Um, viewpoint where i often see the villain as just having this objectively better moral mm-hmm. position than the hero etc cetera, etc cetera. and i love not redemption arcs i hate redemption arcs they're mm. they're generally awful there are some good ones but they're rare they're yeah. usually awful but i do like his stories about objectively awful people that gets into them and gets us to see them as human beings that's why i yeah. love the merchant of venice it's an anti-semitic play but it is mm-hmm. a it's a wonderful play about the humanity of a dreadful man mm-hmm. um there's the, the movie uh, downfall about hitler um it's a it's a troublesome movie in some respects but it is fascinating to me you know so i went into maleficent i'm thinking yeah i am i am go for this like the the story from her point of view and no <sighs> no no <laughs> What do they do with her? They make her an extension of the male characters. Uh, the you know the the only reason she is a villain is because of the actions of a male character. It's like, oh, yeah. my god! And it's it's clearly a, a symbolic rape. Yeah, well, right. Stuff, I, 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 that, my hatred for what they did with that character, because of course in, in her manifestation in the the original Disney adaptation of Sleeping Beauty is she's just elemental evil. Yeah, she's essentially the devil, isn't she? You know, she just turns up and she's powerful and she's brilliant and she's wonderful. She has such a sense of who she is and what she is. She's negativity made manifest, and that's it. She's great. Yeah. She's absolutely I... wonderful. 
I love villains like that. I love I love both types. I love complex villains mm. where you can understand their motivation, people who do dreadful things mm-hmm. out of tragedy or frustration or human frailty, and we get to understand why and we see their point of view and maybe they've got a point, etc. I love villains like that. Right. I also love villains that are just pure evil. Yeah, there's a wonderful, wonderful purity to them, isn't there? As there is yeah. to Maleficent. I mean, it's in her name, for God's sake. Maleficent, that's what she yeah. is. She's She is just evil, and it's great. It's wonderful. Taking her and applying these Freudian backstories and motivations to her, and also, in, in a, what I hate about the film more than anything, is that it seems to feel that it's doing something empowering. It, that it's doing something, oh, we're, we're complexifying her, we're making her into a much more rounded character. And actually what it's doing is powerfully misogynistic. It's robbing her of all agency. Yeah, well, it's it's symbolically again it's it's reducing a woman's entire personality and her entire emotional and psychological and political history because what Uh she does is absolutely political in that film Uh you you, i mean it's not acknowledged as such in the film but you can't talk about challenging kingdoms and (laughs) right and and hierarchies and and royal marriages and stuff like that without it being political it just is yeah and it's reducing her entire motivation in all those spheres to one she was the victim of a symbolic rape uh-huh. which involved her being betrayed and abandoned by the man she loved. And two, I mean, there's probably other intermediary steps, but, you know, I don't remember them. <laughs> two, her redemption is, of course, that she she loves her daughter. <sighs> so her her redemption is that she refind, she finds her motherhood. You right. Know, her proper, wholesome, <sighs> you know, cis-normative, heteronormative motherhood. So she yes. finds, she rediscovers her proper womanhood. She learns to it. conform. Yeah, she yeah, learns exactly. to conform. She learns she, to feel what she's supposed to feel. What she's told and supposed to feel exactly. I mean, around the same time, you had another film, which was the um, the I can't remember quite what it was called, but it was a Wizard of Oz sort of prequel thing that Sam oh, Raimi did. God, that thing that was so that was just evil. It that just was did act- the same thing for the Wicked Witch yeah. of the West, you know. Oh, yeah. she's jilted by a man. That's why she's That's green. Right. That's why she's evil. That's and it's like fuck off yeah. just fuck off i mean I, I love the wicked witch of the west character she's the wicked witch of the west i don't yeah. want to know i you know just i i don't want to know why she is green i don't want to know why she's evil she just is and there is a purity to that kind of character that kind of character who is just the ultimate refusenik to all decency and propriety and convention and thus by definition you know in in our culture hierarchy Mm -hmm. they just say no i won't do it i won't think what i'm supposed to think i won't feel what i'm supposed to feel i won't behave i won't do as i'm told Mm -hmm. i you know i'm no fuck you people i'm just gonna i'm gonna be be a wrecking ball to your civilization (laughs) and of course in in the real world people like that are horrifyingly dangerous and Mm -hmm. we call them nazis and fascists and serial killers and people (laughs) like that but in in texts they 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 have an incredible appeal. Oh, there is something really wonderful about them. There's something absolutely wonderful about them. And sometimes, I mean, I I have to draw myself up short sometimes because I can find them remarkably sexy. You know, like remarkably yeah. so. Um, I, I suppose the key uh, example for me would be uh, Hannibal from that the Hannibal series. You know, I mean, he he is ob- he's oh, an yeah. awful human being. I mean, just 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 I mean, like, you're calling him human is even a stretch, isn't it? Really, I mean, the <laughs> the entity that occurs in in the Hannibal TV series is some kind of fallen angel, isn't he? He's not really human at all, not in any any recognizable way. Um, but by God, is he hot? Yeah, well, of course, you know it's Mad, Mads Mikkelsen. Hey, well, it's Mads. That 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 is that is also part of it. Yes, because Mads. I mean, have you seen the photographs of that man? Oh yeah, I've seen it's the odd one. Fucking yeah. absurd. <laughs> It is. It's, it's insane, ridiculous. It? I've seen him dressed in like a onesie where he's like just like he's unshaven, he's clearly just got up and there's these photographs of him and he looks amazing. Yeah. He's he's just incredible. Yeah. And some of like, the ones where he's actually done up in sort of gothic outfits and <laughs> sh- shit. It's insane. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh. But yeah. um, Han- Hannibal's a really interesting example of the same sort of hovering. Um, I, I can I always forget the categories, but you know, um, uh, 
Todorov's categories of, mm-hmm. of the uncannery, uh, the uncan, the uncannery, the uncannery. The uncannery. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a different, that's a different, that's a different thing altogether. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah no, uh, I, as I say, I can't remember what he calls which, but there's like two modes, and there's one where there's the there's the uncertainty about whether it's all in your head that 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 uncertainty about whether it's all madness, mm-hmm. and then there's the other mode where you know that the horror or the haunting or whatever is happening outside the head of the characters. Right. And some of the greatest horror, I mean, I don't, I don't actually think it's, it's such a great book, but like Dracula, the novel mm-hmm. hovers over that constantly because there's no question that the story we're being told by these people is about an actual supernatural entity because they witness things that can only be explained through the supernatural. But all we have is a load of people's journals and right. diary entries. And even explicitly in the text, we don't have the originals. We have typewritten copies. Yeah. And all the originals are missing. And there's this weird bit, completely unnecessary. Why is it there? <laughs> this bit at the end where Mina says, you know, I, I was I was typing all this up and getting it all, all into order. And I suddenly realized, you know, all I've got is a mess of typewritten pages. There's no <laughs> proof. There's the, right. You know, and of course, half the story takes place in a fucking insane asylum. Mm-hmm. It could be it could be anything. It could be something written by one of the inmates in the insane asylum who thinks mm-hmm. he was the head of the asylum, you know, and, and it's all the more powerful because it just refuses to resolve itself. And there are, I mean, the shining, the movie, that's another example of that. It's not, it's not that it goes either way. It just exists the entire time on this knife edge, you know, right. is it, is it just happening in their heads when Jack is in, is trapped inside the, the, the food cupboard talking to Grady through the door? Is he just imagining that voice or is there actually a ghost outside the door? You know, the film doesn't fall down on one side or the other. Even the next bit where it threatens to fall down, mm-hmm. where the door opens, yeah. that could be telekinesis. Because right. if little Danny is psychic, he could be telekinetic. His father could be telekinetic. He could have opened the door himself. Right. So the film, the film never falls down on one side or the other. And Hannibal does the same thing. Hannibal could be a story about a man who is literally inhabited by a demon mm-hmm. or or a, a, a Wendigo. Yeah. Or it could actually be about like Lucifer himself <laughs> on Earth. Or it could just be a, a, a story about a serial killer. Yeah. And the fact that he's he's surrounded by people who perceive him, you know, <laughs> Will Graham perceives him in certain ways. Yeah. You know. And has visions, as it were, that 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 relate to to Hannibal via Will's subconscious. The the entire thing refuses to ever fall down on either side of that uh, Todorov divide. And I I, just, I love that sort of I thing. Kind of I kind of love hate, it. I do kind I of love it. I hate things that that fall down on on the. Um, I hate the Babadook. Ah, right. The Babadook does this thing where it's it's so obviously about depression. Right, right. And it just tells you that it's about depression all the way through. Uh-huh. And it tells you repeatedly that this isn't really happening, that it's just in her head, that, it, that she's imagining it, that it's her doing it. Even to the point where, I, I can't remember the shot, but we kind of see from her point of view and we see... Um, the the child being hit and it's like she's watching somebody else do it but we can see Uh her hands in front of her face and in context it's clearly what we're watching is her dissociated perceptions of her own actions Mm -hmm. and And the film like makes that overt more or less from the first instance doesn't it i mean there's no real mystery i don't think so and there's they even sneak in a line that explains the book because the book Mm -hmm. the existence of the book as a physical object would be completely mysterious unless except for this one line about her having been a children's author or wanting to be a children's author so the film completely covers its bases so you know you will hear people say the babadook is ambiguous it's not that Mm -hmm. that is not a film about a monster or a ghost that is a film about a woman who is very severely depressed right and right and is abusing her son and I, I, I mean, firstly, I think that does a disservice to people who, who are suffering from things like that. And secondly, it ju- I, I think there is more integrity in the uncanny without that sort of that sort of explanation, because yeah. I always feel like what's being done there is somebody has said, well, we want to tell you a spooky story about a ghost or a monster, but we've actually got more serious mm-hmm. things to be talking about. We've, we're actually talking about something serious, depression. And I think 
what's so inherently unserious about a ghost and a monster right you know ghosts were good enough for shakespeare monsters <laughs> are the subject of the great uh, the, the 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 oldest anglo-saxon poem you know mm-hmm. the, the the monsters and the ghosts they for me they get at the experience of modernity more profoundly like you can make all the realist and you know realism is itself just an ideology right you can make all the realist films about actual people suffering depression and things like that you like but for me there's nothing that expresses that precipice that 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 exists in the world that the modern capitalist world that we live in that precipice that we're all sort of perpetually teetering on the edge of that you could just you could just be walking along and just this this hole opens up and you just fall into it and i think you know certainly the last year that's mm, happened to a hell of a of lot course. of people you of know and, and whether it's economic or emotional or through you know alienation or any combination of those things the uncanny gets at that more powerfully it has this it has this integrity Mm -hmm. you know a a monster can really make you feel what it feels like to be alive in you know western late capitalism in the 21st century more profoundly than any sort of depressing drama about people who are depressed right so any kind of like social tract or whatever i mean there is a kind of cold feet quality to it a lot of the time isn't there you get the impression that the creators maybe don't trust the audience and don't trust themselves to tell an ambiguous story you know they don't trust the audience's intelligence so to understand that ah well this is a metaphor for blah 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 or this is representing blah 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 people are going to think it's literal so we're going to have to explain it in some way by throwing in this element or that element or whatever yeah and what happens then is the overdetermination because the Mm -hmm. authors know what they want to communicate they know what they they want their metaphor to say Mm -hmm. and then they get because they're all sort of semi cinematically literate and semi texturally literate they get worried that they can write it in as much as you like but as you say they don't trust the audience so they have to tell the audience which is how you end up with characters standing around in a circle elucidating the themes of the movie at each other in case the audience didn't get it it makes for this very kind of nitpicky kind of storytelling where excuse me every eye is dotted and every t is crossed and because life doesn't work like that and even stories traditionally don't work like that what it does is it has the effect of making the fiction synthetic it it has the effect of taking you out of the fiction and therefore diluting itself yeah it doesn't work you know it just doesn't work um give me ambiguity any day Really, I mean, one of my favorite yeah. films ever made uh, kind of emphasizes exactly what you're talking about, which is Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, that, that's an incredible film. I love that film, and I do. I love it, it, at the end when it refuses to state, "Oh no, this is all just a fantasy that the little girl is concocting to cope with just the the, the hideous circumstances." No. No, the film actually kind of seems to suggest at the end that it's actually completely real. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and it it allows the 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 monsters of the um, of the supernatural realm and the monsters of the real realm because it depicts you know the the violence and sadism uh, and and authoritarianism of, of fascism mm-hmm. um, in, incredibly uh, starkly you know, in, in the it's absolutely yeah. brutal and what, I, what one of the things I love about the film is that despite the incredible horrors that the little girl faces in the realm of her fantasies her nightmares they are as nothing compared to the brute real horrors that are inflicted upon her and the wor- in her waking world yeah and and yet it refuses to downplay the seriousness of the monsters there's there's mm. no sense in which like the uh, I, I don't know what it's called but like the the monster that that has its eyes in its hands the pale man yeah the pale man that's right who uh, incidentally according to guillermo del toro <laughs> was explicitly based on uh mitch mcconnell <laughs> apparently so and if you look at it it's like yeah 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 it's not an accident that it looks like that <laughs> i can see it i can definitely is, see it yeah but it you know it it doesn't it doesn't at any point kind of say fascism out here in the in the waking world or the grown-up world ergo the monsters aren't really that bad it, no it doesn't oh my disrespect the monsters God, no 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 i mean the pale man for me do you know have you ever heard the story about um stephen king and guillermo del toro no no well apparently they know one another quite well and before um the pan's labyrinth was released to cinemas uh guillermo took a cut of the film to stephen king's house and they sat and watched it and apparently steve during the pale man sequence stephen king was crawling over the back of his seat 
<laughs> he, he found it terrifying. He found it absolutely terrifying. Uh, and it is it, it is one of my favorite sequences in all of cinema. Yeah. The Pale Man sequence. I think oh, it yeah. is... Yeah. It's pitch perfect. You know, yeah. just the rhythm, the pacing, every element, the, the color, the color palette of that scene, the reds, the blacks, the fleshiness. I, I adore that sequence. And that monster... That yeah, and monster. The, the, the bit that freaks me out is sort of the, the the devouring of the fairies. Yeah, you know, and you get the sequence where the fairy is being pushed into its mouth, and mm. its its little arms are trying to push back, and that oh. is just horrifying yeah. to me. I you know, it's the stuff of horror, especially since that that little voiceless fairy has made a connection with the protagonist, with the little girl, you know, and it's yeah. only devoured because she she disobeys. You know, she actually eats some fruit from the table which she's not supposed to do. Yet at the same time, it is something she's supposed to do because if you if you watch the sequence, she doesn't actually get what she's come to get until she's done that. It has yeah. to happen. Yeah, it's a yeah. really strange, ambiguous sequence that kind of inverts the traditional logic of fairy tales. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's 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 brilliantly, uh, and you get the feeling that every part of it has been thought out and has a meaning, without the sense that the meaning of it is being sort of written down and then nailed right. to your forehead. You know, it's not schematic like no. this means X and this means Y, and here's a chart. You know, you, oh my just god, every, no. Everything seems to be freighted with meaning without without the whole thing adding up to just because you because what you get with a lot of things where people create conscious metaphors, I suppose, I suppose allegory is the term mm -hmm. you get. I mean, I don't, I, I don't dislike allegory sort of necessarily on ideological grounds. And mm -hmm. actually a lot of the time when people talk about allegory being too schematic, they're talking about a more modern version. If you yeah. go back to older forms of allegory, like if you go back to um, like Renaissance allegories, mm -hmm. um, you will find that they are actually a good deal more open uh, thematically and in terms of meaning and and uh, you know more sort of um, semiotically unstable than, oh, than they're given credit for my god i mean but, it's why you need whenever you read like dante's inferno you need a copy that's got several appendices in order to understand what it's saying or what it might yeah, be well, saying the the divine comedy is a brilliant example of exactly what i'm talking about because um things definitely have specific meanings you know mm. well, and he refers to specific people he yeah. has specific people in hell who pissed him off. oh yeah yeah i mean some of it is like a gallows jokes you know they, yeah. they they are it is essential you need to understand dante alighieri's life and his relationships in order to understand what he's saying a lot of the time absolutely and yet you know he's too much of an artist to make it that sort of schematic one-to-one -one crashing literal correspondence thing mm -hmm. it's very symbolically open and he he's alive to that fact and it, you can you can read it in different ways you can read mm -hmm. the punishments in different ways beyond the there's a certain literalism built into the whole idea of contrapasso you know where you're punished by your sin mm -hmm. but even within that he opens it out in, in in interesting ways but yeah i mean i i'm not opposed to allegory just ideologically as some people are but the thing about that sort of metaphor that that merges with with allegory that people practice a lot now is that people kind of do just make it schematic you know they yeah. say right i want to say a b c and d That's so it. i need a thing here that means a and a thing here that means b and if you're doing that i kind of just want to say to them well why don't you just write a pamphlet just you know? write it yeah exactly yeah if you're going to give me a tract regard yeah. you know whether it's religious supernatural whatever it doesn't matter just give me a track just give me something that states what you're going to state and that's it yeah. I, for what i find is there is a there is a massive simplification that occurs where people kind of misunderstand the form they are taught often in school to be perfectly honest that um literature says this this is the way it works. You, oh, you can God, interpret yeah. things in this way because this is what the author intended and so on and so forth. And that's how they think literature works. You know, it's how they think expression works when very often it just isn't that simple. Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't want to shit on teachers. No, no, no. teachers are, are amazing. But there, there are a lot of problems. I mean, certainly with the uh, reforms, with the way uh, things are taught, you know, for mm -hmm. of, the, of the last 
decade or so um the the constant testing that forces teachers to drill students mm-hmm. in easily remembered i mean my, michael rosen the, the 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 poet and the writer who who last year got covid and very yeah. nearly died and has now written a book about his experience of nearly dying and it's it's quite i mean i admire rosen incredibly he's one of the he's one of the people i admire most who's alive in the, in the entire world mm-hmm. and it's heartbreaking to hear him talk about this you know he's given interviews and he said i'm i'm not the same person yeah um because long covid has just affected him so much you know he's lost the sight in one eye and mm-hmm. he's he's never going to be the same and he's already an old chap you know it's 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 und- i mean i don't want to be indelicate about it but it's undoubtedly shortened his life yeah and this is a this is a this is a great guy you know he's written fantastic classic children children's books he's written brilliant books of criticism you know he he's written fantastic books of literary history this this is a hero of mine mm-hmm. and he's 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 been through torture you know and you can trace it right back to the actions or inactions of this fucking evil government mm-hmm. we've got now but again you know um off i off i gallop on, <laughs> on my hobby horses but yeah my, michael rosen has you know he's he's of course the son of the educationalist howard rosen mm-hmm. and um you know he's he's been an educationalist himself and he's 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 given lots of talks and speeches and written about this a lot and he's he's been incredibly savagely critical of the, of the changes in the way uh, kids are taught you know taught language he's a very big cr- uh, critic of uh, phonics mm-hmm and he's a very big critic of the way kids are taught because, you know, it's all designed according to league tables. The whole thing has been right. made competitive, you know, because of the market fetish. Right. It's which... utilitarian. It's totally utilitarian, isn't it? There's there's nothing yeah. romantic about it. There's actually yeah, nothing well, mythic about it. It's a perfect illustration of the paradox that uh, sort of free marketeer fanatics always get themselves into, where in order to enforce the values of, of the of the ultra values of the free market in every area of life, which is just not something that happens normally. Right, right. You know, it just doesn't happen by accident. We are not homo marketers or whatever right. you want to call us. We're just not. It's just not natural because it's it's an it's an inefficient and a wasteful and a, and a you know bad way to do a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the free market fanatics of, of which we actually have a government full of these people now. Um, you know, they they want to impose it because they just have this religious faith in the market and market mechanisms. Right. And what they have to do, ironically enough, all these sort of, uh, you know, small state, big society, open it all out to the market, do it all by market mechanisms, people. What they have to do is impose it by force, mm-hmm. by the state, by regulation. So what you, what you end up with is an education system where schools are forced to operate like competitive corporations or competitive businesses competing for points on league tables. Yeah. And what they what they then have to do is they have to drill kids. They have to give instead of getting them to read a whole book or sitting like when I was a kid at the end of the day the teach when, when you know that all the kids in the classroom knew there was just a half hour left of the school day so you were going to get to the end of the chapter and then there wouldn't be questions or uh-huh. work or anything like that you just you, you were just reading with the teacher the teacher was reading to you yeah and it was borrowers or it was whatever you know you, just reading stories encountering stories reading whole books etc reading you know they don't to, to a great extent now they just don't do that no. what they do is they give them like worksheets there's a brilliant this yeah. is why i mentioned michael rosen there's a brilliant speech he gives about this to the i think it's to the nut he he holds up this worksheet that he's got from a school where you've got instead of giving them the actual text these kids have been given a couple of paragraphs of um the, the story of perseus and and the and the gorgon and the gorgon yeah um paraphrased in just this incredible clumsy language and what the kids are given is like a um a multiple choice test they're, they're read these few paragraphs or, or they have to read, read these few paragraphs and then they're given a multiple choice test and you you pass the test in your english course by getting kind of these factual details right oh. and as as michael rosen says this this is as an educational philosophy as a pedagogical philosophy this is empiricism mm-hmm. and it's exactly what charles dickens is taking the piss out of in the opening of hard times mm-hmm. you know where grad grind is teaching the kids ho- you know what a horse is by by giving them like well it's got four feet and is mm-hmm. you know th- that's not how people learn things it's not how it's... literature works it's just no, not exactly. how we engage with literature or art it's certainly not how children engage with it my god i mean you know that, that you're just deliberately sucking all the wonder and the fascination and the joy and the mm-hmm. complexity out of it by turning it into like a multiple choice question mm-hmm. about you know why did uh, uh, perseus 
have a sword with him or right. something. Right, and reducing it to the utilitarian. Taking, I mean, taking something like that as well, like Perseus and the Gorgons, a mythic story, an yeah. archetypal mythic story that's supposed to tell you something about what it is to be human, like fundamentally yeah. human. And beyond that, to be a jolly good wheeze as well, to be a great fun story with monsters story. and heroes yeah. and demigods and whatnot. To reduce that to a multiple choice test... Ah, oh, it's gross. It's, it's, painful, it's repulsive. It? it is repulsive. I mean, and well, like you said, this is—it's not shitting on teachers. Absolutely not. I mean, I, I was. I they was, do what I, they I, do. I trained as a teacher. You know, I, I was yeah. in the education system for a while. It's why I'm not in it now. I can tell you because I don't believe in it. No, I just no, and, don't believe and, and in it. And most of them don't. Most of them do it against their better judgment, without <laughs> wanting to, and they have to. You know, because they can't. They can't afford to 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 not meet the targets, right. the government targets, right. and they can't. They don't want to let their their pupils fail the the bloody Sats and stuff mm -hmm. like that because they feel this incredible sense of responsibility to children, tiny little children whose futures might rest on these fucking tests that mm -hmm. they're being forced to do constantly. What what is wrong with a society that puts right. small children under that kind of pressure? And then of course you have the double whammy of it being a lie anyway. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, being yeah. a total lie, it's the total fiction. If you tell a child that their future relies on these bloody tests, on getting an A in their GCSEs or whatever, it's bullshit. I'm really sorry. It's total, total bullshit. It absolutely is, yeah. And, but you know, I think what's... it does come as a very painful shock to a lot of really good students who actually do grapple with this stuff and get their A's and whatnot, that actually it's not going to mean anything. Mm. Yeah, they get to a certain stage in life, you know, young adulthood, and society sort of turns around and says, oh, sorry, did we lead you to believe that if you followed the rules and did what you were supposed to do and passed the tests and mm -hmm. got good grades, that there'd be a place for you? Sorry, we were lying. Fuck off. Yeah, that's absolutely it. I mean, I know I experienced that when I was a young, you know, when I was a, a young man, I, I, I was an academic, I, I enjoyed things, you know, I actually got very good grades. And then when you, it's often when you go off to university or whatever, you know, and you start to realise that actually, it doesn't really matter a great deal. And the world doesn't care. And what, it, what it's enjoined you to do, what you've been told to do is actually incorrect. Yeah, yeah. But to, to sort of veer back to the, the, the point, the, the reason I raised that about like um, the, the way literature and stories are taught in schools now is mm -hmm. because there's a there's a depressing resemblance between that and the, the, we were talking earlier about that kind of um, criticism. Of, of movies and, and books and so on that is absolutely endemic on the internet you know yeah. people who think well um you know the uh, the the hero doesn't uh, refuse the call to adventure mm -hmm. according to stage three on my graph uh, right. this is a badly written story you know <sighs> and it's it's incredibly there's an incredible you know it, it must be like a, a, a product of culture converging you know from mm -hmm. from the same the same basis as leading different parts of culture to come to the same place not as any sort of coordinated way but just because it just leads you there mm -hmm. the way culture is produced now leads different parts of the society to the same place there's an incredible resemblance between this and the sort of um tv tropes view of storytelling isn't yeah. there yeah, the sort of cinema sins view of storytelling. Yes, cinema sins. That, that, absolute, I, mean, I just, yeah. I just will not. You know, everything that's wrong with blah blah blah. I just, oh, that yeah. that's you, what that's you what you're those, doing with your life, yeah. <laughs> But it's it's not just that. I mean, it is that sort of mean spirited nitpicking in, in place mm -hmm. of criticism, which real criticism is itself a creative art. I think Ian mm -hmm. Forster said that. And it's absolutely true. And it's kind of dead, you know, even even so-called uh, proper critics these days. Are, are, so many of them are just soulless fucking husks. Mm -hmm. But certainly the cinema sins variety and the, you know, nostalgia critic and all this mm -hmm. fucking dreck all over the place. Yeah, it, it's so illiterate and it's so mindless and it's but it's not just that kind of swinging nitpicking. Mm -hmm. It's also just it. As I say, it's texturally illiterate. Like you watch yep. one of those everything wrong with whatever and they they don't they don't understand what they're supposed to be criticizing they say oh it's it's done that it's done the x y and z you you they're basically just describing the fact that it's a hollywood movie and hollywood movies work in certain ways that's, that's sort it. of a mistake yeah. that's it you know? yeah that's exactly it and they're not grappling with any of the the sort of higher implications of the work yeah no. or anything like, and the themes or anything like that I think the the fascinating example of a similar sort of thing, again, this convergence, is when um, uh, Force Awakens came out. 
and you had this sort of army of of Star Wars fans Mm -hmm. who just hated it. I mean, let's be honest here. Everybody knows this. They hated it because the star was a woman and the the, the second star was a black guy. That's why they hate. And they were all coming up with these incredibly elaborate (laughs) explanations of why actually the plot doesn't make sense. And it's like, you 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 hate this character because she's a woman. Mm-hmm. She's good at the force and she's good at fighting and she's good at all the same things that Luke Skywalker was good at in the first one. But you don't like it because she's a girl. Mm-hmm. And you're telling me that you don't like it because it doesn't make sense. In terms of the force, she hasn't been trained. If you look at the Empire Strikes Back, it takes <sighs> Luke a long time to learn. And it's just just fucking shut up. Yeah, absolutely shut up. Yeah, it's I mean, not it's... a mistake. It's part of the mystery of that film is why is this girl who's lived her entire life on a desert planet mm-hmm. inexplicably good at things like flying spaceships? That's part of the point. Yeah. It's one of the things that drives the plot. It's, it's explicitly um, telegraphed as a mystery that's supposed to be powering the story. It's not a mistake. No, just the because whole... you don't like it. A mistake is not something you don't like. It but seems that's to me the, the whole ultimate th- error in right. a story, isn't it? It's, it's, it? it makes a continuity error, or it doesn't. The internal uh-huh. logic doesn't work. Like that's oh. what texts are. Oh my god, I can't stand it. I honestly can't <laughs> stand it. I mean, I, I'm not connected to Star Wars in a in in the way that a lot of people of my generation are. You know, I, I don't connect to it in the same way. I don't have the background with it. But as a result of that, what I always end up doing when they start throwing those criticisms at the new films is go back and look at the original ones. And you know what? They aren't all that. Any They're criticism really that they not. contrive to uh, to ladle at the, the current crop of films, you can aim at the original three and then some. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. it's there is an insincerity at the heart of it, and ultimately that does derive from the fact that a it's 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 a woman who is the protagonist, and there's that you know, and that the, one of the principal characters is black, and also the fact that when you had films like the the Last Jedi, it dared to say to the fans of that franchise, you know what, maybe time to grow up a bit. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there might actually be some, there, there are some complexities in these texts, you know, mm-hmm. and we're going to try and bring them out. Yeah. And people really didn't like that. Oh my God, the vitriol. Oh, yeah, well, they hated it. The they vitriol. absolutely hated it. I, yeah. I was shocked. And, I was absolutely shocked. I mean, it, it, you, you, there are loads of criticisms you can lay, you can, you can aim at the film on technical levels or whatever, or in terms of storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. But the degree of vitriol that that film gets, I find baffling. Yeah, and it made a fuck ton of money. It made more than Force Awakens. It made plenty of money, and yet there was such a backlash from the fans mm. that it actually affected how the studio, yeah. which is ostensibly interested in nothing more than making money. It's interesting because it turns out, despite the fact that Last Jedi made a, made plenty of fucking money, mm-hmm. they actually cared what these people that were constantly whinging on YouTube and Reddit and place, they did care to the point where it affects the next film very, very, oh, very much for the worse. Absolutely. The third film is atrocious. It's a giant it's compromise. It's a, just yeah, a it's, giant compromise. They, they, it is. It's a story that's made in fear. That's made in fear yeah. of offending its fans, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. The bullshit of bringing Palpatine back. I mean, fuck off. It's just awful. Sincerely, fuck off. It's I. I actually really liked Force Awakens. It's not mm. a, you know. It's not. Um. It's not Brecht. Let's face it. No, but, but it's fuck. I it, was I really it was a... surprised. I when I sat down to watch the Force Awakens, I didn't go to the cinema to watch it because I'm not interested. I'm not going to waste time going to the cinema to watch a Star Wars film. I yeah. sat down to watch it probably on Amazon or something awful like that. You know, on my laptop. So in in all the ways, it wasn't meant to be watched. Yeah, I re- I kind of enjoyed it. It was a fun romp, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's got some it's got some surprisingly interesting stuff in it, like the whole idea of making the new bad guy into like a, an an angsty young like incel MRA mm-hmm. type who's got this inferiority complex and wants to be Darth Vader, and mm-hmm. it's the, that's really interesting. It's kind of clever, isn't it? It shows a kind of textual awareness of certain elements of your fan base, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think of deep, like the deeper logic of the original films is kind of like all politics, even like on a galactic level, stems mm-hmm. from like um, male familial neurosis, right? Yeah, yeah. So they, they tie into that directly. The, 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 the Empire has come back, and it's come back because of a neurotic 
you know, mm-hmm. like inadequate male fanboy of the original Darth Vader. <laughs> it's it's really interesting. It's kind of cool. And then isn't you it? have like you have like the whole thing of like Finn being a, a stormtrooper who changed yeah. his mind. Right. That's really interesting. And suddenly you have like this image of stormtroopers as slaves, mm-hmm. and there there might be a there might be a possibility for the slaves to rebel and you have ray who she's she's not just a a a woman at the center of the story she's also a poor person she's not even like like a farmer like luke was in the original luke's family she's literally just living hand to mouth as a scavenger she is no one isn't she there's this whole notion of ray from nowhere yeah and i thought there was some really interesting potential there and then last jedi comes along and last jedi i think he's overrated by some people Mm -hmm. but it's it's a damn good film and i love the way it 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 has it has the balls to like kill off this silly villain Mm. that's that's put into the first film just just kills him it refuses to give uh kylo ren the redemption arc that it seems to be giving him that Mm -hmm. ray is mistaken imagined he's on um it it sort of allows us to see finn as a bit of a coward in some ways who has to learn to be a bit ballsy it it deconstructs poe as a bit of a a, you know a bit too much machismo a bit of a gobby show-off it It, liberates the force you know as uh, rather than being this hereditary thing you know that's the exclusive purview of like this very tiny little club anyone can do it yeah, it actually does this. It does that thing that I I never imagined it would do. It, it bucks the whole sort of Star Wars thing about in the blood. You know, it's all mm-hmm. in the blood. It's a family thing, which again, fucking Harry Potter. You know, mm-hmm. the same story. The same things occur over and over again. It's it's aristocracy of of magic, whatever. Yeah. No, Ray in that movie in Last Jedi, she's just she just is what she appears to yeah. be. She just is nobody. It even and deconstructs it, the Chosen One narrative. I mean, with Luke, obviously, yeah. completely deconstructs it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the the thing, like, one of the interesting, potentially interesting things happens in the prequels is that in the first one, um, the Liam Neeson character, whatever he's called, he finds this kid who's eventually, of course, going to grow up to be Darth Vader, uh-huh. and he thinks he's the chosen one. And so he, the, 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 the original trilogy, for all its flaws, is about, like, the failure of a chosen one narrative. Mm-hmm. And then you can look upon the originals, the Luke Skywalker ones, as another failure of a chosen one narrative mm-hmm. so you get to the the sequel trilogy and it kind of has the balls to just have luke say do you know what this whole sort of chosen one balance mm-hmm. to the force thing it's a bunch of bullshit yeah and the jedi are kind of irresponsible for all this mm-hmm. and it doesn't really walk it back it kind of it kind of says there is nonetheless value in some of this that you can choose to utilize yeah but it doesn't say no you're wrong it kind of says yes and that's it isn't it it complexifies it it elaborates it opens up the entire mythology and does away with some of the the more conservative assumptions that the original films establish but by god the backlash and they hated it Mm -hmm. the people that are supposedly in love with this franchise more than anything else they somebody dared to show them some of its inner complexities and bring them out and play with them a bit and they fucking hated it <laughs> yeah i mean you but, know and they, this is the interesting thing they they express their hatred of it in terms of saying it's a mistake it gets this wrong and it gets that wrong and that's wrong and this is it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yep and uh, but i mean it's it's a very sinister phenomena at the moment whereby there seems to be this reactionary quality in studios where they are so terrified of their fan base i mean on a lesser level you saw it with um the the more recent sonic the hedgehog film mm. you know the, that original design hit and yeah it's it's ugly as fuck it's it's just atrocious <laughs> and they went and changed it because of the fan reaction. My response to it is, no, let it be ugly as fuck. Let it be awful, you know, let it go. Yeah, yeah. But, it but set, it's, for uh... me, it sets up a very dangerous precedent. A very dangerous precedent. If it, You know, if someone has a story to tell, just let them tell the fucking story. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's a it's a strange thing, but you know, I mean, they say first as tragedy, then as farce. In, in this mm-hmm. case, it's more like first as farce than as tragedy. Yeah. But it reminds me very strongly of what happened to Doctor Who in the nineteen eighties. Ah. 
because Doctor Who in the 1980s came under the producership of a man called John Nathan Turner. Mm-hmm. And John Nathan Turner, for one reason or another, he was he was far more interested in what fans thought than mm-hmm. previous producers have been. And he got this guy called Ian, Ian Levine. I don't know how much you know about the backstory of old Doctor Who, but he, he got this guy called Ian Levine, who's like a, a super fan. He's like yeah. the ultimate Doctor Who super fan. And they kind of put him on the payroll as a continuity advisor. Right. And on Doctor they Who? They started... Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> this guy, I mean, this is the 80s, so there's nothing out on video yet. But this guy, of course, he remembers it all. He's got, of like, course, notebooks right, full right. of, you know, what happened in this episode in 1966 uh, and stuff like that. And they start fashioning the program... I mean, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but they kind of start fashioning the program around the concerns of the kind of people that write letters to Doctor Who magazine and join the Doctor Who Appreciation Society, etc., etc. And it's, I mean, there there is some good stuff in 80s Doctor Mm -hmm. Who, but there is some absolutely grindingly awful stuff in Uh 80s Doctor Who. And most of the terrible stuff in 80s doctor who comes from that impulse that <laughs> impulse for feeding the fans and giving them like oh there haven't been any cybermen since 1970 mm-hmm. whatever we'll do a return of the cybermen story and we'll set it on the same planet where the one from the <laughs> 1960s was set. right and it, it results in it's it's just an awful the show disappears up its own arse, well it's always know? going to be coming from a negative space isn't it it's always going to be coming from fear ultimately rather than any imperative to actually tell a sincere story yeah it's always going to be a fear imperative and it's pandering as well i mean that's another thing it is just pandering it's just giving people what they want and there's that i mean i I hesitate to say it but there is that quote which is you know if the audience knew what they needed then they would be the writer (laughs) <laughs> instead of the yeah. audience <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's yeah there's a lot of truth to that isn't there? i mean the whole business yeah. of being the creator of anything certainly of stories is that that's your responsibility that's yeah. what you do <laughs> you, yeah and, and ultimately if you're the audience or the reader or whatever you know just suck it up you know to, yeah. to take what you're given and if you don't like it that's fine mm-hmm. but you you don't have a it's, there's just this sense of entitlement isn't there yeah. it's like these people think they're entitled not only to star wars or whatever but to a certain type of star wars mm. oh a, they think they star- own the franchise they actually think yeah. that somehow because of their it, because of their nostalgia for it because of their sentiment because they grew up with it that they own it they actually yeah. think that they own it i've encountered it so many times in so many nostalgia based fan communities that it just it it does me a grievance you know i, I tend to retreat from them um it, they believe it's their sand pit and i'm sorry they it's not they it's they're not writing it when it becomes their sand pit yeah when when the fans take over mm-hmm. with very few exceptions it gets worse yeah you know it's true it's and, absolutely true and and you're right they do think it's their property and they they express their dissatisfaction with deviations from their idea of how it should be mm-hmm. in terms of this kind of dog rule criticism this 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 internet criticism this genre of criticism that they've all sort of half learned from the internet and mm-hmm. so they talk about well you know what they mean is i didn't like it because there's a girl in it and she got her exactly cooties that. all over the millennium yeah. falcon but yeah. what they say is it's a mistake it's a continuity error because the i was... don't want politics in my video games oh, <laughs> <God. laughs> yeah it's it's a it's a temper tantrum it's an infantile yeah. entitled temper tantrum it's i don't want to share the sandpit i think the sandpit yeah. is mine because i've always been told that it's mine yeah that's the truth of it underneath all of the obfuscating complexities and whatnot that they throw up to actually obscure themselves from this very trenchant criticism is a whine it's an entitled whine and it comes from the fact that they don't want to grow with the text they don't Mm -hmm. want to engage with the text in a different way you know i was watching star wars when i was a kid i don't watch the empire strikes back now in the Mm -hmm. same way that i watched it when i was 11 i i I will always be a fan of classic classic doctor who i grew up with it i started watching it when i was four Mm -hmm. you know I, i have all the dvds i love it i will always watch it i don't watch the tom baker serials that i saw when i was four years old in the same way now it, you, you you know if you're doing that there's something profoundly wrong with you yeah you, it's true 
you must become critical. You must start to look through these things. It's part of a growing up process, isn't it? It is ultimately part of a maturation process where you can accept that the things that you connected with when you were a child that informed the state of your identity and your imagination can actually be badly made or badly produced. They can have myriad negative traits it doesn't mean that they are wrong it doesn't mean that they are abjectly terrible or that you are terrible or wrong for connecting with them you just yeah, and it, you just have to accept the fact that, th- that this exists yeah and you might you might not like the new stuff i don't particularly like the new doctor who mm-hmm. um I, I like some of it like mm-hmm. from 2005 onwards which i think of as the new doctor who because i'm very old um <laughs> you know i like some of it here and there but i don't i, I wouldn't call myself a fan of it i would call yeah. myself an interested spectator but you know what that is you know it's a bit of a disappointment but mm-hmm. it's fine i'll live i've still right. got the 26 years that they made originally you know it's it's fine to just not like it and say mm. oh well this isn't for me this isn't aimed at me anymore because i'm not 12 anymore exactly you know? <laughs> exactly that i mean it's something i mean i love i love cartoons i'm a huge 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 fan of cartoons of every stripe um but one thing that I that makes me recoil from any kind of fan community, regard, certainly regarding the cartoons I grew up with, like the, the late 1980s, 1990s cartoons, is the constant remonstrance that the newer incarnations have somehow ruined or undermined the originals. I mean, for one thing, the originals exist and there's the internet, just go and watch them. They're still there. Yeah. They're still there. They're re- more readily accessible now than they were when we were kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So go and yeah. watch them. Uh, second of all, the newer versions or the newer incarnations are often infinitely superior on an entirely technical and objective level. So, yeah, you know. well, like the the new Shira is absolutely one of the best TV shows That's I've seen in the last few years. It's so brilliant. good. It's so yeah. good. I I I was shocked by it. I was totally shocked by it. I I I don't know what I expected from it. I don't know at all. I don't even know why I started watching it now. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, but my God, is it good? <laughs> Well, I started watching it because I heard your podcast about it with Laura Maurer. Right, right. So. I, I, I am still kind of incredulous about that show. Yeah, um, it's a, it, it's a brilliant show, and it uh, it sticks the landing. It, yeah, you know, right. The end is, you know, that there are there were a couple of things that I had niggles with at yeah. the end, but. On the whole, it but, ends really, really satisfingly. Yeah. How often can you say that right, about any TV this... show? Like not, yeah. not just cartoons or children's shows. Any show at all. I mean, to think that Shira has a a far superior ending to the likes of Game of Thrones, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's absolutely true. It does. And also, really I love the fact, I loved what they did where they took what was implication and subtext all the way through the previous seasons and just said, you know what, we're just going to we're just gonna go for it. We're just going to throw it out. Yeah, it is all about Catra and Adora. That's it. That's, that's what it is. Yes, they are in love. Brilliant. Yeah. I loved that. Yeah. I loved <laughs> that. I, I just, you know, everything up to that point had been metaphor, you know, it, it'd be kind of the implication of their relationship and then they just go for it they just yeah i loved it i loved that so much yeah it's fantastic um right i am uh, so... <laughs> i know uh, but i know we were supposed to discuss alien 3 but <laughs> i uh, i actually have got to go to work in the morning so yeah. i tell you what shall we draw it to a close and shall we make a date to guys listeners we will discuss you know i'm kind of tempted to upload this as alien 3 and then just go just just you know (laughs) um we will discuss alien 3 it will come up um this always happens when i've got to sit down and talk about the alien films there's there's another one of my friends gerard we've been we've been uh, thinking about and trying to discuss the alien films with a view to ultimately discussing prometheus and covenant for years Every time yeah. we sit down to do it, we we talk about something else. 
<laughs> that's interesting Every that really is interesting time. and it's happened again it's so happened that's, again yeah. maybe it's I don't know maybe there's something subconscious going on I don't know maybe there is maybe I don't want to secretly <laughs> anyway we're, we're gonna have to reconvene because I really do I yeah I'm not I'm not actually all that sorry that we didn't quite get no to this, Alien, this was quite great get to Alien 3 this didn't was great it at all I, I, I didn't I have, have a, a chance time. to rewatch it. So right, right. So that that's brilliant. That means that we can. Uh, I mean, I I I I don't want to get into it now, but I I really enjoyed rewatching it this time round. I I, it's great. I really it's great. enjoyed it, like yeah. more so than ever before for some reason. Yeah. No. I yeah. A bit. A bit. Of, I mean, a lot of what we've been talking about in this episode will act as I think as a kind of preface to what we're going to end up talking about with alien 3 because alien 3 is a movie that again the fans hated um, because it wasn't what they wanted and what they wanted was like the second film they all just over wanted again. aliens didn't they ultimately yeah. they just wanted aliens and ironically that's kind of where the franchise ultimately went and it's terrible yeah <laughs> it's terrible so we'll leave that as a teaser, I think, yeah. for the, the big alien discussion yet to come. Absolutely, yes. Uh, let us do that. Jack, thanks so much, man. That was brilliant. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, Thank you for, for letting me come on your show and just no, moan. And, and about... <laughs> absolute pleasure. Is there anything you want to pimp out, by the way? Yeah, um, I blog at a site called Eruditorum Press. Uh, you can find me by just going there and <laughs> searching for my name. I'm one of the names at the top. Uh, links uh, below I'll... as well, by the way, guys. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't write so much these days, but if you want to read my thoughts about politics and uh, fascism and Trump and Austrian <laughs> economics, and also if you look through it enough, you'll find uh, Doctor Who and mm -hmm. stuff about Alien and stuff about Shakespeare and stuff about... Uh, I wrote a, a big thing about um, the, the TV series Legion, which I uh -huh. think is a, is a good piece of work, and I've written about... Brecht and realism and theatre and da 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 da. So oh that, god, that I, could lead us down another path because you you did say to me at one point you want me to tell you what Pathologic Two is. Oh yeah, uh, and yeah, that's that, a Brechtian I, video game. So it's like, uh, that's that's another discussion. That's another discussion. That is. That sounds terrific, and that's actually a nice, neat segue to another thing I do, which is a podcast called the Shabcast, mm -hmm. which you can... That's a strand in another podcast called Pex Lives. I know this is a little bit confusing, <laughs> but if you look for the Pex Lives podcast, you will find my podcast, the Shabcast, sort of interspersed with their episodes because uh -huh. they host them for me. And one of the things I've been doing recently is I've been getting my brilliant friend Holly to explain Final Fantasy VII to God, me because I'm uh, a complete... Have you finished with those yet? Not yet. There's one more episode which I'm I'm taking a long time to edit because some of the some of the subject matter is actually quite delicate. We we get into yes. some quite dicey, delicate, difficult material with that last episode, right. and I want to be very careful before I release it. Right. Um, but there is one more episode of that. Um, I, yeah, I think I think four episodes have now been publicly released, and there's a fifth to come, or it <laughs> might be that episode four is still to be publicly released i can't remember but um yeah holly explains final <laughs> fantasy 7 to me a complete video game novice that's Absolute gone down very brilliant quickly. i can't even imagine i mean i love final fantasy 7 but I, I can't even i i don't even know where i'd start <laughs> well holly holly talked to me about it for i think it turned out something like eight hours in yeah the end, yeah that's over various sessions i i've had sessions with friends of mine where i've tried to explain to them why i get really like hyper excited about this video game from like yeah. 1998 you know um holly is holly is uh, insisting that i play disco elysium with her yes so, um, oh yes uh, that uh, that is almost certainly a forthcoming show my god yes <laughs> uh, so, the, yeah, the um, most politically aware video game ever made it's it's incredible well she said i mean she says it's basically based on on marx and i'm a bit yeah. of an old marxist so mm, she, she yeah she yeah. thinks it will appeal to me um yeah uh as part of my uh, Shabcast series. I've also speak, spoken, as I mentioned before, to Christine Kelly about The Shining, and we also talked about Alien in the in the same episode. <laughs> I've spoken to regular guest on this show, Kit. Yeah, uh, Kit Power, several times about various things. Um, so if you you know my, the the basic format of my show is I talk to an interesting person about something that interests them. <laughs> We've also had so, Daniel on here as well. Yeah, we yeah, talked about Daniel's Bioshock. 
and Daniel as Daniel was a recurring guest on the Shabcast before he and I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't speak German, which is the most important thing I have to pimp, which is a podcast that I do with my uh, my dear friend and comrade Daniel Harper, mm-hmm. who has now been researching the American far right and just the American right generally now for several years. And we have a show called I Don't Speak German, which you can find on Libsyn. Uh, and it's on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all those sorts of places where Daniel explains the uh, the American far right to me. And it started out talking about people like Richard Spencer and uh, through to uh, we, we, we got on people like Tim Pool. Mm-hmm. And now we're branching out into the likes of the the inter- intellectual dark web and stuff oh, wow. like that. And we have God. an extensive. <laughs> extensive back catalog of those episodes and that's been a that's been for me anyway that's been a smash hit so yeah um, highly yeah. highly recommended by the way guys again there will be links below that that is well worth watching you know the, there is a, a slight um trigger warning i suppose with regarding Very. some of the content um yeah but it is you, you, it's fascinating you need to take care because we do talk about some pretty distressing subjects sometimes. Mm. I mean, we did a two by episode on Holocaust denial yeah, today, and some some very disturbed people. Oh yeah, some yeah. really nasty people. Yeah, I mean that's definitely. basically the description of our show. Daniel tells me about a different nasty person each pretty week. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, it, I, I flatter myself it's a good show and it's an anti-fascist show, very committed, and uh, you know I, I think we need that today from all quarters, and yep. I'm very proud of it and uh what else uh, there's my if you want to bung me a dollar a month on patreon that's all mm-hmm. it i haven't got tears if you go bung me a dollar a month you get everything and you get uh shab casts in advance and you get uh, the holly explains final fantasy 7 to me in advance and you get anything i write in advance and you also get a completely backer only podcast series that i'm doing with kit uh and and now daniel daniel has now joined as a host where we go through the conan doyle sherlock holmes stories mm-hmm that's called the Backer Street Irregulars, and we're up to the five orange pips so far. So if you sponsor me on Patreon, you can get access to all of those. And uh, basically, if you want to find me and or any or all of the things I've just been talking about, go to my Twitter, which is at underscore Jack underscore Graham underscore. And now I'm done. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, once again, guys, links to all of that down below. Uh, as for myself, it's the same as usual. You can find me knocking about here on Exaggerated Elegy, where there's all sorts always going on. Uh, you can find links to all of my published fiction over at strangeplaygrounds.com. New short story collection coming very soon, Born in Blood Volume hey. 2, which is coming in the summer, um, which ties up the whole mythology of Aberice and all of that wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um and if you fancy a natty you can come and hit me up over on enigmatic elegy on twitter so thanks once again jack that was absolutely brilliant um and thank you guys for listening until next time bye 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 thanks for having me (laughs) 